Hello, welcome back to CSC 280, Introduction to Cybersecurity. Today we continue our discussion about access control, and in particular we start exploring the mandatory access control model. In the previous video we talked about discretionary access control, in which the owner of a resource controls full access to that resource. What we've figured out is that it, uh, while it is a model that's easy to learn and easy to implement, um, it does have some drawbacks and those drawbacks primarily are the fact it does not scale very well and secondly that it needs to assign owner um, trust to each owner in a system and while in some circumstances the fact that every person in a system is equally trustworthy is justified in many cases that is not the case so today um, in this video I'll look at mandatory access control and we'll discuss several mandatory access control models. Mandatory access control um, removes the concept of ownership from the equation. The system itself is the owner of the resource and that means that security to resources is actually managed externally to the access control system. So it's a little different than what you see in access control in discretionary access control where you know within the system permissions are granted and revoked in a mandatory access control system the whoever does that uh, which could be a security administrator is external to the access control system so that's a little different but it also means that you can't influence the security of objects within the system and that of course could be a benefit especially in an environment where you do not trust all subjects to the same extent. The idea is that in a mandatory access control uh, system, we label um, we label objects with their desired security levels, and we label subjects with their security clearances. And the idea generally is that you know a subject must have at least the level of clearance that the object requires it to have. And you notice from TV where you might see like, oh, you know, I have top secret clearance. And that means that you're allowed to access resources that have a label of top secret or higher, where if you would only have, say, secret or confidential, you would not be able to access that. The other aspect of the mandatory access control system is that most systems um, assign clearances based for a particular capability. So I might have a mandatory access control model that fully focuses on secrecy. I might have another one that focuses fully on integrity. And this, those can coexist, they're not in conflict with each other. But it does mean that we're adding some complexity to the equation. Now we have to start keeping track of uh, what objects have clear, uh, labels, what subjects have clearances, and what the permissions is, are that we're talking about. The first mandatory access control model that I want to discuss today is the Bell and Lepadula model. It's an old model. I mean, old, like really old, like 1973 old. You know, anything we do in computer science um, that dates back to 1973 and is still in use today must have been something that we did really well because, you know, for most other disciplines, 1973 were prehistoric. Um, for us, you know, discretionary access control, in particular the Bell and Lepadula model, still holds today to some extent. It's a fairly simple model. Um, it basically has two rules, no read up and no write down. Let's see what those means. No read up means that, also known as the simple security property, means that if I, as a user, are allowed to, or am cleared up to secret, I cannot read above my clearance level. So that means that anything that I do can only go up to the secret level in terms of reading. I cannot access, I cannot read any materials that are classified as top secret. So in this case, I am providing a secrecy model or a confidentiality model. I can read anything that is below me and I can read anything that is at the same level as I am, but I cannot read anything that is above uh, my clearance. Opposite to that, which sometimes is called the star property or the no write down property, means that anything that I create, any resource that I um, modify or 
add to is going to be classified above me. And that means that I might not be able to access what I wrote, but it also means that I cannot sneak data out. For example, if I would have a top secret clearance and I could read a document at top secret and then create a copy of that document and reclassify it as public, I now have a method for data leakage. And as a result, what we say is that if you create any new resources or substantially change any resources, those resources must be classified at least at your security clearance or above, but not below it. And that's, of course, meant to prevent data leakage. At that point, someone has to go in, review whatever I did, and then decide if reclassification is appropriate. And this is immediately one of the drawbacks of this model. Declassifying information is a manual process. Someone has to go in and do it. By default, as soon as one document or one object becomes top secret or secret, it doesn't matter, at that point, the number of secret documents will grow, anything that's derived from that original one. So it's a model that inherently pushes towards more classification rather than less classification. If all you're concerned about is secrecy, that is completely justifiable, but it does mean that um, transparency becomes an issue sometimes, but you know, that's the whole goal of the model. It's a secrecy model. It doesn't like transparency. On the other hand, what we might be doing is not be interested so much in secrecy. We might be interested more in data integrity. We want to make sure that whatever data we put out there is correct and that we value correctness over secrecy. And we can do that too using a mandatory access control model. And that um, didn't come around till 1977, um, but still, you know, that's a pretty significant amount of time to have elapsed and it's still being something that we discuss today. It's basically the, op the opposite of what we saw in the Bell and Lapadula model. This time we say no read down. You cannot read any data that is classified below your integrity level. Um, and you cannot write any data that is classified above your integrity level. The whole idea there is that if I start working at, say, a highly vetted level, like where I might be dealing with highly vetted intelligence, and I start bringing in noise, you know, unverified facts, I might be influencing the final product by mixing unverified facts with verified facts. And we don't want that. We want to make sure that if I'm analyzing, I'm analyzing based on correct data. So what we say is, if we don't know for a fact that data is indeed of a high level of integrity, you can't use it. Um, unless, of course, you are authorized to work with that lower level uh, data. But you also don't want to go right up. You don't want to go to the point where you can now start creating new objects that are classified higher than what they were originally. Otherwise, like before, I might be able to read a file that has a lot of rumors in it and then reclassify it as factually correct. The next guy will then use the factually correct data, even though in reality they were rumors. Again, the decision whether or not to move something from a low level integrity to a higher level integrity or back it happens outside of the system. Um, it does by um, system administrators. Of course, I can combine these two, right? I can have a um, BIBA approach to secrecy, um, sorry, to integrity, and a Bell and Lapadula approach to secrecy. Um, combini combining these two um, is effective, but it takes um, time and effort. And so that's immediately where the drawback is. There's no way around this system. As an individual, I don't decide on the classification of the products that I create. So that addresses that concern that we saw with um, discretionary access control, where we have to trust every owner in the system. That's no longer the case here. It also scales a little bit better because the number of combinations are just less. Um, so those are benefits. But the drawback is it, it, you know, it becomes harder. There's a lot of overhead that comes with a mandatory access control system. Someone has to maintain classifications and someone has to make clearance, maintain clearances. And both of those are manual processes that happen outside the system. There's another model um, that is more used in commercial enterprise than it is in government or military application, and that is called the Clark-Wilson model. The basic principles of Clark-Wilson are um, very simple, um, but it does lead to a slightly complex model in the first place. 
So Clark Wilson is based on two principles. It means that if I am going to make changes to data, I have to make sure that those changes are done in a verifiably correct way. And if I can't verify that the change that I'm making is correct, and what correct means is a whole different story, but it could be secret, it could be integrity, it could be a combination of the two, I should not be able to make those changes. And so at that point, what I'm left with is making sure that all data transformation happens through well-formed transactions and only through well-formed transactions. The second one is a separation of duty. And that means that if you can create those um, uh, transactions or certify that a transaction is actually correct, you can't use it. And that's, of course, to make sure that you don't write transactions um, for your own benefit and that you then use to cheat the system. It's a separation of duty we talked about before. Um, and so, you know, that's a good principle. If you know that you're starting from a good state and you know that the only state transition can be a verifiably good state transition, then you know for a fact that you always end up in a good state. That's the basic principle of the Clark and Wilson model. What they do there is um, separate out constrained data items from unconstrained data items. Constrained data items are those that are subject to access control. So those are my objects. Um, those are the ones that I cannot manipulate unless I have the proper authority. But I also have unconstrained data items. That's a data elements in my system that I say these are not important enough to protect. The other systems, discretionary, access control, um, Bella, Padula, and Biba, were all or nothing. Here we can pick and choose. We can say these objects are subject to access control, but these are not important enough. And then lastly, we have this concept of the um, integrity verification procedure, which is uh, the steps you, you go through to ensure that a transition is indeed correct. If you put it all in a picture, you get uh, the one that's behind me now on the screen. There's a lot of different arrows and pointers and things in there, uh, but take the time to really study this um, and try to understand what it means. But in principle, the basic idea of the Clark Wilson model is that if I only, if I start from a known good state and I only make known good changes, then I always end up in a known good state. And then of course, there's some overhead that comes with that. That's the basic concept of mandatory access control. So again, the control itself, who decides who has access, does not happen within the system, but it happens outside the system by security administrators. The idea is that every object is given a label, every subject is given a clearance, and that whatever model we use to generate or constrain what actions we can do dictate. Um, so for example, like we said, uh, the Bell and Lapadula module ensures um, confidentiality of data. The BIBA model um, contrain, constrains uh, the integrity of data um, to make sure that data only stays um, usable and plausible. And then Clark Wilson takes a radically different approach and says, no, we only want to deal with known good transitions from a known good state. And that means that we're always in a known good situation. And we can apply that to both secrecy as well as confidentiality. Next video, we'll talk about role-based access controls.